So welcome everyone and welcome back to Thailand Talks, the um, lecture series organized by the Department of Southeast Asian Studies at uh, Bonn University in cooperation with the uh, Asienhaus Stiftung. Um, we have a, a lecture series, um, let me find it. Can everyone see that? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, um, Originally, we were planning a lecture series uh, before Corona hit us, and actually, it was um, Duncan Macargo's fault that we started it because he uh, sent me an email said that he was going to come to Bonn and whether uh, we wanted to have a meeting with him. And uh, of course, I said yes, and then we organized this lecture series around that. So, um, <laughs> uh, and then when Corona started, we thought we'd, um, we'd do it anyway, and we, we switched online. And um, yeah, it's. Um, we have a very interesting lineup of academics, uh, uh, people from the media, and um, activists, Thai activists uh, in exile. Um, and uh, today, I'm very happy to um, uh, to have uh, to invite Duncan Macargo, Professor Duncan Macargo, to uh, to speak um, on the topic of the rise and fall of the Future Forward Party. Um, we'll introduce Duncan in a minute. Um, so far, we've had. I'm gonna, uh, had Nicola Glass uh, talk. We've had Nick Nostitz, and we've had we've had Am Neko. So uh, all these three um, talks you can still watch on the YouTube channel of the University of Bonn. Uh, they they uploaded a week later after the the live uh, talk. Um, so if any if you've missed one of them, uh, you're welcome to to view that later. Um, and this uh, week it's the fourth lecture um, with uh, Duncan Macargo, who is a household name in uh, for for people working on Thailand, especially Thai, Thai politics, and. Um, but I'll let Kevin Philip um, take over. Kevin is a student here at Bonn University and he'll be moderating this session. Thank you, Mr. Pai. Um, we want to um, start with the uh, session now. And um, yeah, as I already said, my name is Kevin Philip. I'm a, stud a student at the um, Institute of um, Oriental Studies in, in, in Bonn. And um, today we, we are going to talk about uh, the rise and the fall of the Future Forward Party. And as guest, we have um, the speaker, Professor Duncan McCargo. And a few words um, to Professor Duncan McCargo. He is a leading expert on the political science, and he um, does a lot of field work, and his research interests cover Buddhism, political reform, oriental politics the media, and the current agenda of Professor McCargo is to understand the tactical mindset of politicians and how these um, politics of the country and Thailand affects um, the society. Um, currently, um, also um, a recent book that has, that has been published is uh, Fighting for Virtue. And in this um, book, he analyzes how judges actually work in Bangkok and how this um, affects the politics in Thailand. And now we want to listen to the, um, the talk. Thank you very much, Professor Duncan McCarty. Thank you very much, Kevin and Oliver, for the, the warm introduction. It's a, I, I'd really been hoping to go to Bonn, so I've never been to Bonn, and this, this all started as a cunning ruse to get my trip to Bonn subsidized, and now my trip to Bonn is taking place from my living room in Copenhagen, so it's all, it's all been a bit of an adventure. Uh, hugely glad, though, to have a chance to, to talk to people about these matters. Um, I said I'd only talk for 10 minutes, maybe I'll talk for ever so slightly more than 10 minutes, but I don't want to talk for too long, so I'd like to have a kind of informal conversation about the topic. Um, this book was just mentioned, Fighting for Virtue. Um, I wasn't actually specifically thinking about plugging the book, but now you come to mention it. Uh, if people are interested in the book, I can send Oliver a flyer and you get a discount if you order it from Cornell University Press. I think it's a 
30% discount or something. So if anybody wants the book, uh, it's kind of hard to get hold of anything now because distribution systems have become a little more compromised by the coronavirus situation. So um, that book is one that I worked on for about six years and I got very bored of working on it and I decided that I wanted to do something quick and fun. Um, so it's a rather fortuitous turn of events in some ways, but you know, a few months ago, I had this idea about writing a book called um, The Rise and Fall of Future Forward. I think it was fairly clear by November, December of last year that Future Forward would sooner or later be gone. Um, so I came up with this plan and I proposed it to the Nordic Institute of Asian Studies Press. And the uh, head of the press was, was kind enough to agree to publish the book. I'm at the moment, I have to confess, the director of the Nordic Institute of Asian Studies, so I don't know whether he would have said no to me if I wasn't, but he has published three of my books before I came to work at NIAS, so I think there's a fairly good chance. Uh, and I, I think he also thought there was a reasonable chance that people might buy this book because a lot of people are interested in the subject. So this is the, the cover of the book, and you're the first people ever to see this cover, apart from a tiny handful. Um, it's got a photograph on the cover, which you will see in the, the slides in a minute. So, but that's just a printout of the cover. The cover, the book itself doesn't exist, but we are submitting it to Nia's Press on Monday. So we have, we've used the coronavirus lockdown to write this book. I'm writing it with Anira Chatrakun, who is a, a former PhD student of mine from Leeds. And we basically have written the book in 12 weeks. So it's a quick and dirty book. Um, I hope it will be readable and interesting, but you'll have to forgive any failings because I wasn't able to go to Thailand and do my usual spend months hanging around and talk to lots and lots of new people. Um, we've had to find new ways of doing research and that might be an interesting topic to discuss as well. How do you research a country without being able to go there, which is something I haven't usually done. I've normally first go to Thailand for a year, first go to Thailand for the summer and then write something. And this time it's, okay, we're gonna write this and we're gonna figure out how to do it without going to Thailand for once. So maybe we should see a few of the slides. Would you mind Oliver showing the, the slides for us? Um, I'm cheating a bit here because back in December, I gave a talk uh, about Future Forward as Thailand's first digital party. And I think you've been, you've been circulated, those of you who are in the class will get a copy of this paper, this, which I wrote for a conference. So after writing the paper, I realized there was far more than I could fit into the paper. And I was actually going to write a book about it. And that's when I got in touch with Annie Rat and we decided to do this book together. Uh, but the paper gives some preliminary insights into the topic. And I've got some slides that that go with it. So the main purpose of me showing slides is so that I can inflict my photographs on people. And this is uh, this is one of them. This is at the Future Forward headquarters. Those of you who know Thai will know that that says actually not Future Forward, but New Future. And so the Thai name of the party is different from the English name of the party. And that's something that's a little bit curious. But in Thai, it's not Future Forward, it's New Future. So what is this new future all about? Perhaps we go, can we go to the next slide. Thanks. So for those of you who are interested in political science, oh, whoops, the, sorry, we just, we just we've shot ahead. For those of you who are interested in political science, um, which may not be everybody attending this session, there are a lot of theories about parties. Uh, people have tried to understand parties in different ways. I was very influenced by the idea of the electoral professional party. This is an idea that came in um, in the 80s, pioneered by a scholar called Panabianco, an Italian scholar. Uh, so he argued that it's less and less important that you have actual members and actual branches and actual ideologies and actual party manifestos and things, because really parties are more and more about winning elections and being very professional, focused on the leaders and focused on marketing. And this is something that I could really relate to in terms of what was going on in different places in Southeast Asia. 2019, a guy called Paolo Gerbado published a book called The Digital Party. And he says that there's a new kind of party out there which doesn't need to exist very much in the physical world. It can exist virtually. He wrote all this before the coronavirus because we're all digital universities, digital everything these days. So he argues that the digital party is a hyper leader. You've got a, this dramatic leadership figure. You've got a platform, which is the way the party operates instead of an organization or an institution. And then you've got a super base 
the super base, if you like, are the followers. They don't have to be members anymore. They have to be people who follow the digital party. So this is one way of understanding Future Forward. It's not the only way. And as we've been writing the book, we've become probably more skeptical about this idea, but it's a way of thinking about Future Forward as a party. Um, so we decided that we'd organize the book around three topics. And this uh, is based on a classic book about British politics written by a guy called Jean Blondel in 1963, the year I was born. That book is called Voters, Parties and Leaders. So we decided that our Future Forward book was going to have three main chapters, but we were going to change the order. And the first chapter is going to be leaders. Um, and then we're going to have a chapter about voters and then a chapter about the party. Okay, so here's the hyper leader. Um, this is one of my photographs I took of Tanatorn during the election campaign last year. Now, I don't know how many people here know about Future Forward and who Tanatorn is. Do many people know about Tanatorn? Yeah, he is a very, very rich man, I remember. Yeah, he's, he's quite rich. Uh, people talk about him as a billionaire. That's yeah. a little bit confusing because he's a Thai baht billionaire. He's not actually a US dollar billionaire or a Euro billionaire. He'd probably be a Danish krona billionaire. Um, but, you know, he's, he's very, very wealthy and he's the richest MP. He was the richest MP in Parliament until they kicked him out of it recently. So he is... Um, he inherited a company from his father called Thai Summit that produces auto parts primarily. Uh, he inherited it when he was very young in his early 20s when his father suddenly died. He wanted to go off to Africa and do good work with the UN and he ended up building up this massive auto parts company, making chassis for Tesla and things like that. Um, but he was very, very successful in business. But all the time he was harking back to his earlier days as an activist, a student activist and a very idealistic figure who wanted to change the world and do good. So here he is, he's actually at Tamasite University with Siri Art Hospital in the background. He's about to go on stage for a TV debate. This is on the 17th of March, 2019, just a week before the election. Um, so you always see Tanator with his white shirt and his three pens, this geeky three pen look, um, spiky hair. Um, and I, I, I heard that he was gonna be around there. I ran into him. He had no staff with him. He was completely surrounded by screaming young women who were trying to get his autograph and his photograph. Um, and he was very patiently signing all these things for them. And he's, he's not a guy who goes around with an entourage like most big shots in Thailand. Okay, you have the next one. So the, the party is not just Tanaton. Um, and the leadership is not just Tanaton. So in the book, we talk about the leadership actually in terms of not just one person or two people, but three people. So the second very prominent leader of Future Forward is the Secretary General of the party. And actually, I should say was because the party was dissolved on my birthday, the 21st of February this year. Um, it's a little bit sad. And there you'll see, this is the press conference the, the Monday lunchtime press conference at the party headquarters the last August. And you'll see in the middle there is a woman called Fanny Gawanit, who is the party spokesperson. And uh, she is an LSE graduate and a very, very articulate former TV journalist who really became a leading figure in the party alongside the two main leaders. And although during this press conference, Fanny Gawanit, as the party spokesperson, is actually presiding with a couple of her colleagues flanking her, you'll see lurking in the background larger than life cartoon figures of Tanaton and Pierre Butte, former uh, law lecturer from Tamasat University, who was known to many people for his radical positions espoused during his time as a member of a group called Nitirad, which was famous for calling for reform of the Les Majesté law and revoking the 2006 coup and annulling all its works. So you see, uh, although Banigar is presiding, um, Ibut and Tanaton are still there looking on in this sort of Japanese cartoon style form, which I find extremely surreal. So you see the hyper leaders uh, in the background there. Okay, can we have the next one? So there you see the cartoons and the, um, the figures up on stage. So the question is really, 
an important one in terms of thinking about where Future Forward came from. Future Forward was just created in March of 2018. One year later, March of 2019, they won 81 seats in Parliament. Actually, that's not strictly speaking correct. They won 80 seats, and then as a result of a by-election a few weeks later, that went up to 81 seats. Uh, that made them the third largest party in Parliament. But, you know, this was a completely brand new party. They didn't use conventional methods for campaigning, and they did not have any former MPs on their list of candidates. So they came out of nowhere. And a lot of people argue that they did that partly because of their mastery of digital technologies, their adept use of social media, Facebook, Twitter in particular. Twitter, Twitter, as many of you will know, is more the place where the troublemaking, dissident, critical type people hang out in Thailand these days. Facebook has become rather more mainstream. Um, so Future Forward was very adept at creating digital platforms that allowed them to reach voters and particularly younger voters who are a very, very important part of their, of their vote base. So one of the big questions in studying Future Forward is this digital party question. How far is the party a, a real organization and how far is the party kind of a virtual party? Because um, they got 6.3 million votes, which amazed a lot of people, including me. Um, it's quite surprising how successful they could be. Um, and ended up as the third largest party in, in the Thai parliament with spending very little money and not campaigning in most conventional ways. Okay, so perhaps we can see the next one. So there he is. Um, everybody gets to see this photograph. It's the one that's going on the cover of the book. Uh, I wrote an article for the New York Times right after the election, and I said to the person who commissioned the article, will you use one of my photographs? She said, I've never commissioned a photograph from anybody who wrote a column for me. I said, I'm, I want to be the first one. I'm going to send you the photograph. Fully expecting her to say, get lost. You know, you're not a photographer. But she said, I've shown it to the New York Times picture editor, and we're going to run your photograph and print it. So um, that was my biggest achievement of last year. It probably never happened again. Uh, but the reason why I like the photograph so much is because Tanaton looks kind of like Jesus. He's, he's illuminated by a bolt of light coming from somewhere in his white shirt. And you see the super base or whatever you want to call them, the followers, and you can feel the energy and, and radiant enthusiasm uh, of these new generation people for Tanaton. Now, the problem with this is, you know, are these people really interested in Tanaton's political ideas or have they turned him into a K-pop star? Uh, and Tanaton himself is rather sensitive about this. And when I asked him whether he acknowledged that people had turned him into a pop star, he said, no, 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 that accounts for less than 5% of my support. But I don't know. It certainly didn't do him any harm. It's hard to say how, what proportion of the 6.3 million votes came from people who were more like fans than conventional uh, followers of a political party or campaign. But that's certainly an element in Future Forward's attraction. So there's a lot of different stuff going on here. Okay, what's next? I can't remember my own slides now. That's the last one, right. Okay, so let me just talk about other reasons why these people might have been drawn to Tanatol. Right after this, he went on the live debate at Tamasa, which was done by a you know, there are all these new TV stations, online TV stations with interesting perspectives. This was done by a group called Workpoint News, uh, who did some very interesting coverage. TV debates became absolutely huge in the election last year. But of course, most people don't actually sit and watch TV. So what matters is not so much the TV debate, but the clip, which is going to be extracted from the TV debate and sent around by social media uh, and appearing on everybody's phones. And in the TV debate, um, which I was very fortunate to be able to watch live just after this, Tanaton at one point said, I, t I challenge you know, the army commander Apirat to, uh, are you, I'm, I'm asking you, are you gonna come to parliament and shoot dead all 500 MPs, including these other party leaders up on stage if you don't like us? Why are you threatening us with coups and why are you talking to us in this obnoxious way? Now, people just don't do that in Thai politics. Nobody goes on stage with a bunch of, Apisit was there, Sudarat was there. Uh, nobody goes on stage with a bunch of other politicians and says, army commander, are you gonna come and shoot us all dead? Uh, and of course, at Tamasar University, obviously a place where talking about 
shooting people and actions by the military is very, very salient. And this, this gathering here is taking place in front of the pretty Phnom Yong statue and the, the dome building, which is so iconic in our imagery and understanding of the history of Thailand's politics. So Tanaton was bold in calling out the military and setting out his stall as a party that was highly oppositional, that would not compromise with the hunter and was insisting that now was the time for open representative politics, that elected politicians had to come to the fore and that the military had to stop pretending that they had any kind of divine right to run the country and, and really move over. So this is really the question with Future Forward. Why did people vote for them? Was it because of their messages? Was it because of their policies? They also had quite a lot of policies, but it's, quite, it's not always easy for people to remember what their policies were. A lot of the informants do and people we interviewed when we asked them what exactly were their policies, they would struggle after a while. They would say they were against conscription. They wanted to cut the military budget. Yeah, anything else? Those are the things that really stuck in people's minds. So it's partly policy, but it's partly just a sort of ideological anti-military stance. And then there's this generational thing. What proportion of the 6.3 million people were these very young people? You know, Thailand doesn't have good survey data and election data of a kind that can really answer that question for us. But anecdotally, there was clearly a high proportion of support. Most of the Thais I know under 30 seemed to decide to vote for Future Forward, even though they might have had some reservations at certain points. Um, so there's a sense in which Future Forward introduced a new cleavage and a new mode of, of uh, or the, or the came to represent that new mode of um, opposition, which was very much not just the old yellow, red, countryside versus city, middle class versus lower class split, but also uh, how old are you? And on that basis, we can have a very good idea of how you might have voted. So you found very, very similar political ideas being expressed by people right across the socioeconomic spectrum. And that's something that we've come across a lot during the, the research for this book. So those are some of the things. Now, um, in a nutshell, as I've already mentioned, it's a two, a two year cycle here. The party's launched in March 2018. It, it achieves spectacular success in the elections in March 2019, gets the 81 seats briefly, then back down to 80 again, um, and then dissolved by order of the Constitutional Court on technical charges that frankly, to most people, don't make a great deal of sense about the loans that, that Tanaton made to the party, and whether those loans were actually or were not actually donations. But really, it's, a, it's like any excuse to wind this party down. So it's a short story. Um, we open the book by saying, you know, it's, it's a mystery story um, because it starts with a cold-blooded murder, but we know who committed the murder. The mystery is actually how the victim got into the position that anybody would need to murder them in the first place. And that's what the book is really about. So that's what I've been working on in a nutshell, and I can talk a lot more about it, but maybe I'll just stop there and um, invite your questions. Once again, I'd like, like to thank you, Professor McCargo, for your um, enlightening talk. And um, um, as said, and now, um, we would like to ask questions. If there are any, the discussion is open now. Okay, and, and who picks the questioners? Anybody is um, free to um, just um, um, ask questions. Oh, but who decides who, who gets to ask? So far, it's uh, people, it happened kind of organically, so I think... Okay, uh, all right. I wasn't I sure know. if I was supposed to invite people to ask questions or whether that's Kevin's job, so I don't want to... Uh... It's, it's Kevin's job and he'll... Uh, I think people are just slightly... There's always the, the you know, two, two minutes yes. after the talk where they're just it's sinking in and... Yeah, uh, okay. But you, you, had, you had one, did you, Oliver? Um, Okay, well, I can I can kick off maybe um, if that's okay. Uh, you had your so, virtual hand up, it seemed. Yeah. I mean, it seemed. No, I was clapping. That was me. Oh, yeah. um, okay, that's a clap. Is it? See, I'm but, uh, not going on this. I'll stuff. just maybe just kick off the uh, the discussion then. Um, 
uh, I mean, really interesting. I'm really looking forward to the book. I, I think um, I really like the photograph as well. And if you look <laughs> at the faces of these people, yes. I would yes. say um, there's more behind it than, mm. you know, it's a kind of professional digital party type right. uh, argument. So um, right. I was sort of sensing uh, a kind of formal uh, discussion of, of the the for or I mean a discussion of the political form, but um, mm. a slightly disconnected from the the radicalization of Thai uh, people in the politicization of society. And I think um, I mean you kind of uh, you were moving in that direction at the end. But I would I would sort of uh, want to ask whether isn't that really the real explanation is that um, Tanaton is basically expressing and and Piyabut and Panida, uh, mm -hmm. you know, expressing something um, where people are really, really fed up with military rule, mm -hmm. but also disappointed. Uh, there's a feeling that people have moved on from just the simple tax in politics mm -hmm. because of the disappointment also with the leadership of Pua Thai uh, yes. in the face of this military rule. So that someone who's coming out and saying, you know, as you described so uh, so nicely, uh, you know, military. We are against the military. We're gonna um, we're gonna shrink their budget. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and we're gonna um, make sure that they don't have any role in in uh, you know politics within Thailand, and mm -hmm. they they should do their job of protecting their country. Yeah. I think that's a, that's one of the the major uh, reasons, and and so it. So this super base you're talking about is really, I would say, it's it's a politicized uh, constituency. Mm. Yes, it is. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, we've been playing around with different explanations. I think I'm going to end up writing a paper about the digital party for a more political sciencey journal because that's a very nice you know, way to to try to conceptualize things and engage with larger debates about political parties in other in Europe and other places. But in terms of understanding Future Forward in its own terms, uh, yeah, we've been struggling with a lot of different explanations and part of it is the ideological one, but there's also a danger of, you know, me or other people projecting our own feelings about Thai politics onto the, the voters. Uh, so part of what's going on is clearly Tanaton and others were able to articulate a sense of frustration with the with the military and with the hunter. Um, but then quite a few of the people we interviewed who supported Future Forward didn't seem so strongly wedded to that ideology as all that. Some of them were. There was a wide variety. A lot of people were just bored and frustrated and tired and wanted something new and something different. And the other thing that comes through again and again, I mean, Tanaton talks about take a walk with me. We're going to go on a journey. Come on this journey with me. It's all about change. And it's rather like Obama's first term. Change what? Well, it doesn't really matter, but you're bored of what's going on now. So, we'll, you know, we'll go along with any idea of change. So lots of people were very, very willing to give Future Forward the benefit of the doubt because they just wanted some sort of change. It was any change. We just can't go on like this. The sentiment of we can't go on like this is a, is a recurrent one. But a key skill of Tanatorn and Vanegar Beerbutt and some of the other people in the party is their capacity to make an emotional connection with voters. Voters believe that they're very, very sincere. Now, I'm ultra cynical. I, I've written books about two other Thai politicians, Jamong Simon and Taksin Chinua. I became incredibly cynical about both of them. I, I can't get really cynical about Tanatorn. You know, he's very, very genuine. Uh, insofar as any politician can be. He's not perfect. He has all kinds of issues and problems and his ideas are sort of contradictory and so on. But he's a, he, he and the people around him are as genuine as anybody you can find in Thai politics. Uh, perhaps they wouldn't be if they got into power it would all start to change. But there is a kind of uh, a radiant sincerity about the project, which is singularly rare. Uh, and I've been studying Thai politics for really an awful long time, and I haven't come across much of it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you very much. And then um, I would like to continue with another question that hit, hit me when I read the text of Mrs. Glass today. Mm. 
and namely that uh, you mentioned that um, um, the future Ford party is mainly targeting the young ones and they are uh, very, very popular uh, uh, among the social media but um, I read I read for example that um, and they um, they try to ban the activities of the party because they um, try, try to instigate hatred um, for the monarchy or for the military. So what, what is your opinion on, uh, on, on this matter? Well, you know, that's, that's one of the allegations. Um, the problem in Thailand is if you come out with any kind of critical perspective on something, someone sooner or later is going to say, oh, well, you're trying to bring down the monarchy, you know, Lam Jiao. This is the, the allegation that they'll wheel out against anybody who has a critical perspective. Uh, and Tanator was fingered before. He's, there was a diagram that the military produced uh, in 2010, which I've reproduced in my last book, showing these people who are allegedly plotting to overthrow the monarchy. And it's a kind of imagined conspiracy theory that the military came up with. Uh, so I think, you know, it's, it's just a very, very classic tactic to try to discredit anybody who comes along and says anything critical and saying that, well, you're really just out to uh, abolish the monarchy, to stage a revolution, to do this, that, and the other. But actually, you know, a lot of people criticized from the other side, criticized Tanaton and Pierbrook from the opposite side. You know, when Pierbrook was in this Niti Rad group, he was campaigning for the reform of the Les Magistrate law. As soon as they formed uh, Future Forward, he wouldn't talk about it anymore. He and Tanaton never talked about reforming the Les Magistrate law. They didn't want to uh, go down that road, that route of saying very provocative things about monarchy that could bring that sort of charge up against them. So actually they became um, very, very reserved and restrained on these kind of subjects during the, the time when the party was operating. And it, it was something that Pierre in particular was criticized a lot for because he had been outspoken on that subject. So uh, they've been very, very careful to avoid exactly that. Of course, that doesn't stop people from accusing them of it. And there were all kinds of, you know, the case that, uh, successfully brought down the party. This technical case about loans was just one of about 20 different cases that were brought against them. And some of the others are directly related to uh, monarchy and, and so forth. And they so far haven't sort of been as, as fruitful. But that kind of allegation is going to be made against anybody who says these kinds of things. And the military, of course, will hide behind the monarchy and say, well, if you're criticizing our budget, then in some way you're criticizing monarchy as well, which is really far-fetched, but it doesn't stop people from subscribing to this idea. That to if you criticize any, I, I wrote this after about network monarchy, which I think is referred to um, in the, uh, the blurb. I can't get away from the 2005 article that I wrote. Um, but yeah, as soon as you start going into that area, you'll find that everybody rallies together and says, well, if you're criticizing us, then we're working on behalf of the monarchy. So therefore, by criticizing us, you're criticizing the monarchy. And that produces a situation where you can't have a sensible discussion about anything. Because as soon as you say, well, isn't there a problem with the military having a massive, unaccountable secret budget? You'll say, oh, well, are you criticizing the monarchy? Well, no, actually, we're asking about the military's massive secret budget. So this is the problem that you get into very easily. And, but what, we, what people did like about Tanatorn was his boldness in confronting the military and raising a lot of uh, taboo issues like this in parliament and during the election campaign. And it was his fierceness that attracted a lot of young people, even young people who might not really have subscribed to those ideas, but they just enjoyed uh, the sense of role reversal. Uh, and that's something else I, I, I've talked about before. Um, you know, the, the sentiment of young people that they were tired of being patronized and they wanted to be able to think for themselves Um, Thank you very much. If I, if I may, I would like to ask a question too. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Um, I'm yes. Nicola. I had yes. the privilege to uh, yeah. kick off the uh, talks uh, three yes. weeks ago. And um, actually, um, then I would like to ask, so the political situation we see in Thailand today is a result of the old red-yellow conflict, which remains unresolved, actually. So on the one hand, we see people who want dictatorship to continue, sadly mm -hmm. enough. While many others, particularly long, young Thai, Thai uh, people, would like to see genuine democracy. So what would you say in which way could um, a former party, we have to say, sadly say, former party like Future Forward Party, now transcended into a movement, um, could contribute to a democratic future? And, uh, so, and how necessary 
is it to build networks with other pro-democratic forces? Yeah, I know. It's all a bit of a sad situation. Obviously, although Future Forward doesn't exist, we do now have Move Forward, of course. So 54 of the MPs from Future Forward to count to a new party, um, which, you know, if you talk to those, some of those MPs, they'll tell you, no, we're still doing the same thing. We're carrying on with the spirit and the project. It continues. But we know that, you know, the leadership of Move Forward doesn't have the same kind of charisma and the same kind of boldness and fierceness that characterized uh, the Tanaton Fiebrufanica uh, group. So that's a bit sad. They have, of course, taken themselves outside Parliament and created this progressive movement. And that does give them some freedom to do things that they weren't able to do when they were constrained by by being in politics, per se. But frankly, it's pretty depressing to think of three extremely capable people who had the potential to assume ministerial or prime ministerial positions in Thailand going forward, to have those people banned from politics for 10 years. And there aren't that many people with that kind of uh, ability and potential who were, were willing to step up to the plate in the way that they were. So it's a, it's a, it's a bit sad for everybody because the message is, if, even if somebody with the advantages that Tamaton had with his family, wealth, and connections who you think will be relatively uh, secure to go down this road because he has a lot of backup. Um, if he couldn't get away with it, then what chance do lots of other people that we can think of of, of really being able to establish a, a critical position in Thai politics? So it is rather depressing. Um, other pro-democratic forces? Well, the problem is most of the other political parties are a bit iffy. Um, you might have noticed there was a no confidence debate in Thailand in February and Future Forward was the only party that voted against the government ministers who were uh, being scrutinized in that no confidence debate. Pur Thai and all the other opposition parties walked out and failed to show up to vote against. So Prawit and all those other, Priyut and all those people were given a free ride. It's only Future Forward who said, we don't have confidence in you. Everybody else said, uh, Sorry, with, for technical reasons, we can't vote now. We've agreed that we're going to leave the room. Uh, so we can't really rely on the other political parties very much. The other political parties are uh, compromised, would be a very polite way of putting it. They're operating within the system and they may seem oppositional, but their degree of opposition uh, doesn't measure up very well to the kind of standard that Future Forward set. So that's a bit of a problem. Um, we don't have, you know, the red shirt movement is not what it was. Uh, there aren't really other opposition movements that have the capacity at this moment to, to offer a, a great deal of resistance. Now, never say never again. The great thing about Thailand is just when you think something can't happen is just when everyone's about to come out of the woodwork and we've all seen it before. So uh, it's very dangerous to predict where Thailand will be next week, let alone next year or in five years from now. But at this very moment, uh, things don't look encouraging. I wish they did, but they don't look terribly encouraging at this minute. Well, yeah, actually, I, I didn't think of um, necessarily um, some, some parties, several other parties or parliamentary forces. It could be maybe what we have seen before uh, Corona pandemic hit the world, that uh, there was a growing student movement protesting against uh, Prayut and uh, his mm -hmm. regime, demanding explanations yeah, because of the dissolution of the Future Forward Party and uh, demanding the, uh, democratic rights and freedom of speech. So um, it is not about other parties or the parliament itself. As you said, the uh, conservative side is never running out of excuses here. Yeah? But uh, maybe probably uh, it could be another movement, a student movement, a movement of other young people. A lot of young Thai people voted for a Future Forward Party. So a lot of uh, first-time voters decided to give their vote to Future Forward Party. Maybe there could be, I don't know, a combination of several forces outside mm. parliament to demand uh, democratic structures and uh, freedom of speech, freedom, something like that. So I wasn't necessarily thinking of um, other parties. And I, or, uh, I know some of my uh, interview partners recently said um, that uh, so far the red shirts um, in his regard and pure Thai party and hibernation. So yeah. maybe there are other pro-democratic forces uh, who, can, who, who can do it. Yeah, and we, did, we saw a glimmering of that with those student protests right after the dissolution of Future Forward. But, you know, that had petered out even before coronavirus really took hold. It was not, it didn't go on as long and as, as vociferously as many of us thought it might. 
Now, that doesn't mean it can't come back again, uh, because we've been there many times before. As I say, just when you think you're safe, someone is going to emerge uh, and start doing something which you couldn't really expect. Uh, and there's clearly a lot of frustration out there, a lot of people who feel that they have been um, shut out of the system and don't have a voice, and they'd like to obtain that voice. But um, I, I wish I could say I felt really optimistic, and I, I, I don't just yet. I, I, I'd like to be proved wrong on that one. Um, Thank you again. Um, I would like to ask the next question. Sure. So I asked a few of my uh, friends uh, who are Thai what makes them want to support Thanaton and his party. Mm. And a lot of them pointed out that he wants to reduce the gap between the rich and the poor. Um, so I think we all know that there's a sort of problem there in Thailand. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to know if there were any, and if so, which ideas or propositions in his election program that would actually like help achieve this goal? Because oftentimes um, those are just like empty words, I guess. And from what I've heard so far, his election program is mainly beneficial for the middle class. And I don't actually know much about it though. That's why I'm asking. I, don't, I haven't read any, um, anything about his program. So um, I just uh, would like to ask you whether the party mainly serves the needs of the middle class or has actual ideas about reducing the gap between the rich and the poor? Yeah. Um, if Tanaton was here, he'd be, uh, was here, he'd be able to give you very good answers to, to those questions. But yeah, I mean, one of our big questions has been, did any of that stuff matter? Like were people really thinking so much about those kinds of issues in their decision to vote for Tanaton? Some people certainly were. Um, one of the interesting things, you know, the criticisms of Future Forward when they were launched in March 2018 often went along the lines, yes, these are a bunch of hipster Bangkok kids and their hipster Bangkok ideas about Thailand don't really have any relevance for ordinary kids, uh, kids in technical colleges, kids doing motorcycle racing uh, around town at night and, you know, more typical kids. But what was interesting was that in many ways, the Kids, uh, young people say in provincial universities took their cues from the kind of cool, unconventional signals that Future Forward was sending out. And you know, we, from our own personal experience of the team of people we had working with us on this project, we discovered that you know, right across the socioeconomic and class divide amongst our immediate team members, let alone our informants, there's very little difference between the way that younger people were thinking about future forward based on whether they were kind of up country or, or middle class Bangkok families. And that was that was quite surprising to us. But in terms of what you know what Town Tom was really going to do, some of the economic stuff is a little bit hazy because, you know, do you trust billionaires to close the gap between rich and poor? I mean, this is one to me one of the big problems. It was a big problem with Taxin, and it was a big problem with, with Tanaton. It's hard to take somebody who's very, very rich seriously when they tell you that they want to close the gap between rich and poor. Uh, and of course, he himself fired quite a lot of people from his factories at different times. And he did not have a good track record in labor relations and things like that. So there are some question marks about it. But I think one of the things that came through very clearly from Future Forward's program again and again is their attack on so-called monopolistic companies. So Tanaton tries to set up this distinction between companies and monopolistic companies. So companies like his, which went out and hustled for business competitively are uh, one thing, and companies that were granted a monopoly by the government to uh, be able to produce uh, alcohol and to be able to control duty-free concessions or things like this are in a different category. So here, what, one of the main things that the party argued was that you had to take away the privileges of certain big companies in Thailand, which were in many ways analogous to the privileges that the military and elements of the bureaucracy had acquired for themselves. And that's a very powerful message. He was basically saying, big companies have got strangleholds over whole sectors of the economy, including the agricultural economy, where they became the only people who buy certain products. So lots of people may seem to be doing small scale farming in the Northeast, but they're selling everything that they're growing to these big conglomerates who are then putting them into 7-Eleven stores. So this was the kind of rhetoric he was using. We need to give opportunities to you, 
to produce your own goods on your own terms and not be locked into a dependency relationship with a conglomerate that has a de facto monopoly on certain kinds of products. Uh, and that was a message that was quite powerful and attractive to people. It might also be one of the main reasons why Future Forward was closed down, not the military and the monarchy stuff. This stuff is terribly, terribly threatening to people who are making an enormous amount of money out of the status quo. And when you have a political party that actually starts pointing at this out and saying, why do all these people have licenses to print money? Uh, shouldn't we take them away from them and, and let lots of other people uh, get hold of some of that money? Then you can imagine how a coalition starts to build for these guys have gone too far, we have to, we have to take them out. So it's not just about the, the legal stuff or the military or monarchy stuff, it's also about people who've been benefiting very considerably from the status quo and people who have been bought into a charmed circle of those who benefit from those kind of deals. So I think that's where Future Forward's policies did become quite interesting. I think it's a somewhat tendentious distinction between big companies and monopolistic big companies, but you can see how um, it works to a certain extent and how it's a powerful sort of we're back to the dreaded populist word again, uh, but it's a powerful, potentially populist message on the campaign trail to say, look, these evil big companies are taking all your profits and I'm going to uh, stop their monopolies and then you're going to be able to sell your goods in the marketplace freely. That was definitely, if you watch, so studying Thai politics now is all about YouTube. Everything's on YouTube. All, all Future Forward's rallies are on YouTube. You can see Tanatol's stump speech, the same stump speech with variations that he gives in 20 different provinces. It's all just sitting there waiting for you to watch. And this is how we we're doing the research for the book. It's absolutely fascinating to see how these messages are put out there. And anyone who wants to do any kind of textual analysis or whatever, it's all there. Everything is there now. Forget the Bangkok Post. It's all on YouTube. So you've got to be able to follow the tie. Um, but if you can do that, it's incredibly access to information compared to when I was doing my PhD studies or other projects I did a few years ago. I just couldn't get this stuff. Now, uh, you know, I've, so we had teams of people last year going around Thailand attending rallies, and I've got the notes that they took. But then I think, oh, I don't quite understand how they describe this particular sequence of events in the rally. You know tap the name of the province and the date into, into YouTube, and I'm watching the rally, and I'm comparing the assistant's notes with what Tanatorn actually says. It's mind-blowing stuff. Sorry, I've deviated yeah. slightly from answering your question. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah. But you really get a feel for it by looking at those campaign rallies. We got another question from Mr. Schaffer. Would you like to um, ask a question? Yes, thanks. Um, thanks, Duncan, for this um, for this talk, and I'm very wow. much looking forward to your to the books. Actually, yes. two books um, uh, that were mentioned. Um, I was just, I mean, and it's uh, intriguing to see, you know, uh, Future Forward as a digital party. And I was thinking of, um, you know, have you have you looked into a comparison to other young charismatic leaders? Because it, it looks like kind of a wave, a global wave, you know, with uh, Sebastian Kurz in, in Austria, and then you have right. Macron in France, yeah. and Trudeau in, in Canada. On the yeah. one hand, they have rarely been, they have rarely been characterized as, you know, being leaders of a digital party. The mm -hmm. digital party, on the other hand, goes with a new authoritarian populist leaders, right? Like Bolsonaro and Trump and all those guys who are actually using, you know, Twitter a lot for... Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, at least um, all all those you know elections that went into uh, well to our taste the wrong direction are then blamed yeah. on Twitter. So how come? I mean, is what what is what is the unique thing then in in Thailand? How does that go together? And um, and did you look into a comparative you know perspective? Yes, yeah, Jabado's ideas about digital parties are all at the opposite end of the spectrum. He thinks that this is a progressive strategy so he's looking at these the pirate parties and uh, and so mm -hmm. forth emerging across europe so his examples are all european he doesn't really acknowledge the existence of a world beyond europe which is a problem mm -hmm. of most political theorists um but yeah so you can look at digital parties in lots of different ways uh and yes you could say that someone like trump is a hyper leader but you wouldn't really say that the republican party in the united states is a is a digital party mm -hmm. uh and Jabado gets himself fairly mixed up saying that momentum which is a a pro-Corbyn movement within the British Labour Party is an example of a digital party, except that it's not a party, but that's the kind of thing that he's talking about. So the Zhivado book about digital parties is, is at the other end of the spectrum. It's excessively romanticizing certain kinds of political movements and assuming that they're inherently progressive. So he sees that the digital parties are progressive 
force. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, clearly it's much more complicated than that. Uh, and you know, the, this debate will, will run and run and it's also changing very, very rapidly uh, as we go. But I mean, to me, the digital party, if there is such a thing, is a development of the electoral professional party. But Jibado is not ready to acknowledge that. So this is where he and I part company. So for me, you know, you start with the mass party, which is members, branches, party congresses, resolutions, and leaders are, leaders are constantly having to account for themselves to the members of the party, right? That's the classic Duverge mass party. The electoral professional party is Tony Blair's new labor. It's Tony Blair and a kitchen cabinet of people as he slouches on his sofa, deciding how to run the country. Uh, you know, you pay as little attention as you possibly can to the national executive of the party and to the party conference every year. It becomes actually a big joke because the main thing is Tony Blair himself communicating directly to the voters through the media. And the digital party takes it to the next level where basically you don't need a party at all. You have your hyper leader and you have your super base and the rest is just a platform, mm -hmm. which could be anything and could be nowhere. Um, so it's, it's an interesting concept. Um, mm -hmm. It only goes so far in explaining something like Future Forward because Future Forward, um, you know, Tanaton doesn't like the idea that Future Forward was a digital party, surprisingly enough. And he keeps talking about, you know, we had all these events and rallies and, you know, altogether two million people turned up to our events. I think mm -hmm. a lot of the two million people were the same people who went to all of them, but mm -hmm. still, two million people did show up to the various Future Forward events during the, the two years or so. That so it's not an either or thing. Like, I don't think there's any 100% digital party where mm -hmm. the leaders have never been seen and the followers have never shown up at all. But there is definitely something in the idea that you can organize politically without physical meeting. And, and this is, of course, something that we're all experiencing in the post-corona world where I'm, I'm directing an institute that I haven't set foot in for three months and we're having uh, an academic conversation uh, without being in the same country, let alone in the same room. So we can see how new modes of political possibility have emerged in this digital era, but how to, properly to conceptualize it and how it relates to the, the world of online activity is not so sure. I think what is worrying about it, and this is partly relating back to Nicola's question, 6.3 million people may have voted for Future Forward, but how many of those people would actually go to Siam Square or Bat Prasong or anywhere else and show up to defend um, Tanaton or to denounce the military or something like that? It's quite difficult to get people who've participated digital to participate in, in the sort of offline uh, sense. So this is one of the big dilemmas. But yeah, we, we don't have all the answers. This is absolutely a work in progress and future forward was a work in progress and just as we were starting to learn from it they've stopped it and now we're now we're back to square one you know i wanted to see what happens to a party like this in year three in year four um what happens when they get to the second election can they pull off the same kind of thing again which a lot of it's based on the novelty factor when you don't have the novelty factor can you still win and so on so I'm not sure I've really answered your question, but I, I'm just oh, yes. acknowledging how difficult a question, how important and difficult a question it is. Yeah. Mr. Pai, do we have any further questions or comments? You're Sorry. muted. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, there are no comments in the chat, but I'm sure some some of the other participants will have I, or? I have another question, Duncan. Okay. Uh, there was, after the coup in 2014, there was a small student movement called the New Democracy Movement. Yes. It was pretty tiny, but still. And I saw some familiar faces at the, in the leadership of Future Forward. Uh, can you say something about this, if this student movement actually uh, moved into this new party? Yeah, there are some people who made the transition over from that movement into the new party. I guess one of the most prominent is, is Rang Siman Ro, who is still yeah. with Move Forward. So he was one of the main leaders of that kind of student-initiated anti-coup resistance. And I think he was briefly uh, locked up three times in the, the early period after the coup. 
he's an absolute firebrand speaker and he was one of the stars of the, the no confidence debate but they actually were so terrified of having him speak that this is why the, uh, the both the government and opposition parties cooked up a, a cunning ruse to run out of time so that he couldn't speak so Rangsiman proceeded to give his denunciation of General Prawit, uh, not in the parliamentary chamber, but in the lobby of the parliament building. Um, and that got more attention than anything that happened in the parliamentary chamber. So there are some of those people and they're carrying on that sort of fiery tradition. Um, but they're only one element of mm. Future Forward. I mean, if we look at when Future Forward was first set up in March 2018, there were quite a few of those kinds of people amongst the 26 founding members. There were these very young 26 founding members, average age about 30, many of them with very interesting backgrounds and critical positions on different social issues. Most of them disappeared. Um, only five or six of them ended up in parliament. Um, some of them resigned. Some of them fell out with uh, the party leadership. Uh, so we have an image of Future Forward, which partly comes down to us from those articles we read about the party when it was first established, when we saw all these very young and idealistic people. Not all those people are around anymore. Not all those people were even around until the end of 2018. Some of the most interesting ones slipped out or, or in one or two cases stomped out rather noisily from the party. So. Rangsin Man is one of the kind of authentic uh, survivors from that more radical tradition of Future Forward. But you've also got in Future Forward these more policy wonk type people, these more uh, pragmatic type people uh, of whom there are rather more now in, in Move Forward. And of course there were the opportunists because a, a significant number of Future Forward MPs actually jumped ship to Bum Jai Tai, which is the most ultra pragmatic uh, of Thai political parties as soon as they had the chance. Four of them were actually expelled by Future Forward for not voting on the part, along party lines mm -hmm. and, and a whole lot more as soon as Future Forward was dissolved. Instead of going to move forward, which is what they were meant to do, they ran off and took the money. They got huge payoffs to defect to other parties. So like everything else, Future Forward's messy and complicated. It's very heterogeneous. You've got these really idealistic, critical people who come out of that anti-coup movement uh, and then at the other end of the spectrum, you've got people who just went along for the ride and sold out as quickly as they could, and a lot of other people in between. And did you see uh, former red shirts moving into that party? There are not very many former red shirts in the uh, Future Forward Party. I think they kept the future, the former red shirts out mm. on purpose. They're, they're a liability. Yeah, yeah. They tried to keep. Anybody who had achieved prominence in either a yellow or red movement away because they were attempting to brand themselves as orange, which is for some people, orange is the new red, for some people, orange is the new yellow, and for other people, orange is a combination of the two. And for a fourth group of people, orange is just a bright new color that has nothing to do with the previous colors. So you can interpret orange in four different ways. Okay. Um, but they were really anxious not to be seen as a continuation of the red shirt movement because they knew that was the kiss of death electorally. You know, to win votes, you have to move into, into the center ground. So the whole secret of Future Forward was that they attracted a lot of people who used to be sympathetic to the yellow movement, some of whom were actually taking part in the PDRC protests. They switched to Future Forward. Interesting. Yeah, that, Thank was, you. that was really what they were trying to do, because if you couldn't win over people from the other side, you had no chance of, of getting 6.3 million votes. And how would you say uh, the influence of the banning of Thai Raksa Cha, the second uh, pro taxin party? Uh, could you take a guess how many percent of the votes? Yeah, the I, actually, I've, we're just writing that, rewriting that section of our chapter again. And I've got to see what my co-authors come up with, because we got some information from the Future Forward Party that I was struggling to interpret. And she's just come up with a new reading of it. But uh, one thing I can tell you right off is, um, so, Thai Raksa Chart was running in 100 constituencies and Per Thai was running in 250. A lot of the 100 constituencies that Thai Raksa Chart ran in were where Per Thai wasn't so strong. So they were part of the purpose of Thai Raksa Chart was just to collect party list votes without much mm -hmm. realistic expectation of winning the constituency. That said, Future Forward won 22 of those 100 constituencies, which is not bad for not a party. Um, 
So they did get quite significant benefit, not just from the party list votes, but also from the constituencies, because they probably wouldn't have won nearly as many of those 22 if Tyrax Archard had been in there. Uh, but to put an exact figure on it is very difficult. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if, if you think Future Forward got 6.3 million votes, I wouldn't be surprised if they got a third or more of those votes from people who would otherwise have gone to Tyrax Archard. Uh, so actually, and this is one of the ironies, and this is a point that people who, who sympathize with Future Forward will not like, but we have to make these two points. First of all, Future Forward always criticizes the 2017 constitution. Mm -hmm. It's the main beneficiary of the 2017 constitution. It was devised with an electoral system to favor medium-sized parties. Right. That's how Future Forward got where it was. It was designed to penalize big parties and to boost medium-sized parties. That's Future Forward. And the, the dissolution of Tyrax chart was legally fairly absurd. No very good reason for dissolving that party. It was the best thing that ever happened to Future Forward. So two things that they've been highly critical of, they were the main beneficiaries of. Without the 2017 constitution and without the dissolution of Tyrax chart, Tanatom, if he'd set up the party under another system, he might have ended up with far, far fewer MPs and had far less impact. So they actually did really well out of this terrible system and this terrible decision. And that's one of the great ironies of the, the whole phenomenon. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah, okay. Duncan, thank you very much for your great presentation and the many details and the talking. Um, I would like to know what are the basic materials for your research and the results you presented today and for your new book? Yeah, well, I hinted at some of it. Um, YouTube, yeah, we have spent okay. hundreds of hours on YouTube. We've also, uh, you know, and I have, we have two research assistants who've helped us who are very young, so they're in the mentality of the kind of the, the way young ties post on social media. They have done an yeah. enormous amount of searching through Twitter accounts, mm -hmm. an enormous amount of searching through Facebook, uh, mm -hmm. Facebook Live videos, and a lot of reporting. Some of it's from mainstream newspapers, but a lot of it is from these new online media uh, organizations that have long interviews and very detailed coverage of certain kinds of political developments. Mm -hmm. So uh, basically the stuff's all in Thai. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's all social media and it's all online. Mm -hmm. We have, you know, I had interviewed Tanaton and Fanica a couple of times before. I'd interviewed Pierbrook before. Mm -hmm. uh, we've interviewed several other key figures in the party, some of them during the course of the project and during the course of the last few weeks online. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we've also, we did a survey which uh, we've used then to identify further interview uh, subjects, people who are supporters of Future Forward. We um, did some phone interviews and various other things. So we've been trying to use different kinds of, of methods to allow us to get around the problem of not being able to go to Thailand and see people face to face. But I should also have said earlier that this project came out of a project I've been running for the past few years about Thai elections funded by the United States Institute of Peace. And they supported us last year to have a whole team of people who were collecting information during the election campaign. So we've got all the notes from that, which relate to not just Future Forward, but all the other parties and all, all mm -hmm. other aspects of the campaign as well. Mm -hmm. So we have quite a large amount of material, uh, mm -hmm. some of which is publicly accessible, some of which we have generated ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And newspapers, Bangkok Post, no, no, Nation, Channel, Channel 7, Chong Chet, Meow. <laughs> uh, Chong Jet, sure, yeah. I mean, that, but yes, less and less the Bangkok Post and the Nation, you know, the English okay. newspapers play less and less role in my uh, uh, data gathering as time goes by. It's more and more the Thai stuff and more and more online media that you've never necessarily yeah. heard of, but have posted a very interesting interview. And, you know, strange YouTube channels where they do kind of pop programs about celebrities yeah. that you, yeah. you'll find Tanatol and Peabrook popping up on these mm. celebrity shows talking about their haircuts and okay. strange stuff like this. So we've been going through all of that as well. It's mm. been quite an adventure and I've never watched so many YouTubes in my life. 
as I have the past few weeks. Really? Very addictive because mm -hmm. it's so exciting. You know, you're, you're reading about something that happened in an, in an interview, these TV debates or something that someone said in a rally, and mm -hmm. you can just find it and watch it. It's quite mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. We are thinking of writing an article about, you know, what kind of methodologies to use to do online research about Thai politics mm -hmm. on the basis of this project. Okay, I'm looking forward to your book and I will improve my research. Thank, thank you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Professor McCargo, thank you very much again. And would you like to give us some concluding remarks? Well, you know, I, I think I've made most of the, the most important points. Um, I thought I wasn't going to study in a, a specific political party or political leader again, having written a PhD thesis about Jan Long Si Mung and then written a book about the taxonization of Thailand a few years ago. And when Tanatol first came on the scene, I thought, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm, not, I'm just not going there again. Um, but then one thing led to another. I, I interviewed him in Bangkok in 2018. He came to LSE and I was involved in an event with him at LSE in 2018. He came to LSE again in 2019. I went to interview him again in Bangkok. I followed him around a bit during the election. Um, like it or not, the future forward phenomenon for all the different reasons that we've been discussing in this session, uh, it has been the most interesting development in Thai politics of the past few years, uh, because it all comes together, the military and monarchy stuff, the business stuff, the electorate stuff, the social divisions, the generational divisions, the, the new media, uh, it's a story with something for everybody. So I, I, I also, I'm very, you know, I love academic work and I just, you, you saw me show you The Fighting for Virtue, which is this book that I worked on for years and years and years. It's just absolutely stuffed with incredibly detailed and nuanced research. I wanted to write a quick book that people would read um, you know, Taxonization of Thailand is the best-selling book that Nears Press has published so far. I wanted to try and write a book that might sell more copies than the Taxonization of Thailand. Uh, we've written the book in a very accessible style. We're banishing all the notes to the back. There won't even be any footnote numbers in the text. Um, you know, I'm trying to write the book like a novel or like a, a fun uh, story. It's all about people and their journeys. It's not like most books about politics. So. I'll be interested to see whether people can accept this. It's kind of an, an anti-academic, academic book. I've become a bit tired of academic books. I've, I've read a huge number of them and I've written a few of them myself. And I'm trying to find a format that will reach out to a larger uh, audience because I think this is a topic that deserves a larger audience. And it deserves the, the knowledge and expertise that an academic training brings to a topic, but we don't have to be so stuffy about it and we don't have to be so caught up in our own frameworks and jargon. Sometimes we can just give ourselves permission to have fun with the topic and try to, to let the story um, work, work for us and for the reader. So that's what we've tried to do with this project. It's a bit of an alternative project. It's an academic project, but it's also uh, an unacademic project in other respects. So uh, I hope that people will um, Read this book. We should have it up on the NEAS website so you can download it very easily if you can't get it from anywhere else. Uh, we are hoping to have the book out in the next two to three months. Um, so that, you know, For sure, I can say that I'm uh, also a more fan of um, easygoing and easy, 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 yes. easy to read books. So right. I, um, I might also um, get my hands on this book and I'm, I'm happy to read it soon. That would be uh, Mr. Mr. Hipke, would you like to introduce um, the topic of our, of our next uh, session and our next stream? Kevin, I think uh, yes, I Mr. Think he's left. So, um, I think he forgot that he has to do that. So um, the next lecture in this mm -hmm. series will be in two weeks time. Right. Um, we, so we have an internal seminar session next week and um, so the next, uh, the next lecture will be by uh, Wolfgang Schaffer mm. and the topic will be the One Belt, One Road initiative mm. uh, in Thailand and it's all about how that's connected to you know, the, the conflict within the elite between Taksin and the network monarchy and uh, development perspectives mm. in Thailand and the rise of authoritarianism. So uh, I think that's going to be an interesting um, discussion as well. Um, 
that's all we have time for today. Um, also, I'd like to express my thanks to Duncan. It's it's great to have a lecture which is based on very very fresh uh, material and um, you know, coming straight from the bookshelf. Uh, and yeah, um, I mean, we will obviously um, order the book for the department, but I think um, uh, people will probably be downloading the ebook as well in in the Corona uh, era. Uh, so thank you once again for for joining us tonight. And um, looking forward to seeing um, most of you in two weeks' time. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you very much. Ollie, also from Asia House. And have a nice night. Thank you. Okay, goodbye, everyone. Okay, bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye. bye.